it's great to be here. I wish it weren't raining, but I kind of, I lived in the UK from the age of two to the age of 11. I lived in Wiltshire in a small little town called Devizes. And uh, I was born in Canada, so I'm, I'm a genuine Canadian. But I experienced the kind of cold and damp that there was in Wiltshire, especially through the winter months. So it didn't really surprise me, although I had heard that Devon was the uh, center in the UK for good weather and wonderful, uh, you know, wonderful times. But uh, I came at the wrong day. Uh, let me make a few preliminary comments just to sort of set the, the landscape. Um, I consider myself a pluralist, which means I don't want to particularly advocate for one way of thinking about agriculture. I'm going to spend a lot of time on genetic modification today because I think it's been underserved in our attention in terms of its role in agriculture. But that is not to be misunderstood as wanting to push for genetic modification over other ways in which we can approach our food and approach our agriculture. Secondly, I've done lots of work in different arenas, as John was saying. Uh, I was the president of a local non-governmental organization dedicated to the preservation of agricultural land in Canada. I work with a non-governmental organization in Kenya that is largely focused on agriculture in rural areas of Kenya and helping uh, women's collectors uh, I feel awkward saying this as a man, but uh, it really is only possible to make change in uh, Eastern Africa, the area where I know best, by working through women rather than men. The, the men just aren't going to do it. Um, so the work has been with women's collectives. Uh, I have also, on the other side, worked for some companies that you think have done some consulting work for companies that uh, you will find uh, rather divorced from that side of my work. I've done consulting work for Bear Pharmaceuticals, largely on their blood uh, product side, so largely on their biologics, not on their pharmaceuticals. Uh, I've done work uh, with the president of Monsanto, um, looking at issues around public policy, uh, ways in which they can realign their thinking with respect to uh, genetic modification. I know that Monsanto is a company that in the European Union has a pretty bad name. And I think at the time that it generated that name under a former president called Shapiro, it was well deserved. I mean, Monsanto was very arrogant. Uh, the European Union was wrestling with not just GM as a technology, but also trade issues and so on. So ultimately, uh, Monsanto. Uh, deserved what it got in terms of reputation. I think it's a company in transition and turning around. I'm more than happy to answer questions about what I might know about Monsanto from that side rather than from the outside looking in when we come to the question period. So that's by way of kind of declaration that I've got exposure across a landscape. Some of it uh, you might find questionable, some of it uh, laudable, depending on what your starting perspective is. So, I'm going to talk about food uh, today, and in particular the way in which we think about the growing, uh, the production of food. And I'm going to start with an assumption that conventional agriculture is unsustainable. And by conventional agriculture, I mean what we've been doing for the last 60 years. It's not that we haven't made some interesting and important changes in the way in which we uh, grow food and the way in which we manage land, but it's still one of the most damaging of the activities in which we engage. So this is from the World Wildlife uh, Fund website, and it gives a breakdown of aspects of agriculture. So uh, agriculture uses 55% of the habitable <coughs> land, and that footprint is growing as the population expands. 70% of the human use of water is in agriculture. Most of it simply drains away. Uh, 70 to 90% of farmers lose more carbon per year than they put back. It is the highest industry use of chemicals. Higher than pulp and paper, higher than the ones that are usually on the list of environmentally damaging uh, industries. 
Not that those other ones aren't environmentally damaging, but you can see that agriculture is uh, high on the list of damaging uh, things. It has more impact overall in terms of pollution than any other human activity, and about 25, this is a very big range, I, I realize. I'm not sure why the World Wildlife uh, Federation didn't think that it could narrow it down a bit more, but 25 to 40% of greenhouse gases contribute to climate change. Uh, on this one, uh, and I may repeat this a little later, David Suzuki, who uh, some of you may know about, he's a Canadian geneticist who, for probably the last 40 years, has been a television and radio personality and been on the speaking circuit for environmental issues, said in, one, in our uh, province in Western Canada, where they have lots of beef cattle at one time, that the flatulence from beef contributes more greenhouse gas than all the cars in North America. And he was you know, virtually laughed out of the room. It turns out that he's right, that the methane from cattle uh, flatulence is exceptionally high and a very high greenhouse gas uh, polluter. So this is the picture of what I'm going to assume as the background is unsustainable. And even if all factors remain constant, we can't continue on this path. But a lot of factors simply are not going to remain constant. And two that are worth thinking about is, first of all, population growth, and secondary, secondly, increasing affluence. Let me flip the order and talk about increasing affluence uh, first. As people in, uh, and I say this as someone who works in East Africa in an attempt to lift people out of poverty and therefore make them more affluent, probably it's going to be a long time, if ever, that they'll get to the affluence of uh, rich countries, but lifting them out, as I do so, I know the impact of this, where they are surviving on minimal amounts of food. Many people starve they will be demanding more as they have more resources to make the demand. So as affluence increases around the world, and you can see this in China already, demand on food supplies increases. Population growth is a really big problem, however. So this is from uh, the United Nations data, the world, uh, the world population data. Um, in 2010, we get, 2011 rather, we passed the seven billion uh, mark. So we're slightly higher on the curve than when I put this arrow there. You can see where most of the growth is taking place. This is the rich countries. And around 2000, coming up to 2000, we began to level off. And the expectation is that population growth will remain relatively constant uh, going out to 2000, to 2150. The less developed countries, however, are just going to balloon. So you can see that just ballooning out. And here's a couple of other ways of thinking about this. This is the United States growth pattern. And if you take births minus deaths, which actually gives you the rate of population increase, it's about a half a percent per year increase. If you add immigration, which is the largest driver, you get close to 1% growth in the United States. If you then take a look at India, the current births minus deaths is 1.38. 1.44. And if you add immigration, it actually drops because there's more emigration than immigration in India. Kenya, the growth rates, births minus deaths. Remember, this is a country that's racked by malaria and AIDS. And nonetheless, births minus deaths is about 2.6% per year. And immigration doesn't, uh, the inflow and outflows are about even. So if you take, if you tabulate this, uh, as a cumulative growth projection in 28 years, Kenya's population will double. We have so far escaped the Malthusian, what I call the Malthusian wolf. This is the, the Malthus that Darwin was so influenced by, where Malthus said that populations will expand geometrically and the means of subsistence, food being one of the major ones, will increase only arithmetically. At a certain point, they will cross, and where they cross, there will be a struggle for, for survival. We've kept that Malthusian wolf away, largely by the application of science and technology. The Industrial Revolution had lots of downsides, but it had some upsides, and we have benefited from that Industrial Revolution, and we have managed to be able to mitigate 
many of the downsides once we took the time and care and trouble to mitigate them rather than simply assume that we had to live with the negative consequences. So the message of technology is that it brings benefits. Because that's my message about technology, is it brings benefits. But we've never had a technology that doesn't also bring with it harms or at least risks of harms. In fact, there's almost nothing we do that doesn't, that we do for our own benefits, that doesn't entail risks. Uh, just walking here and crossing roads involves risks. So always we have to be balancing out the nature of the benefits and the nature of the risks or the known harms. The idea is to identify, mitigate, monitor, and then assess whether the benefits are sufficient to warrant handling the harms. This is a scheme that I like. It's from uh, Joel Feinberg, a social philosopher. And this is the way he thinks you should do the calculations around benefits and harms, whether it's downhill skiing, uh, whether or not it's driving a car on a highway. In order to assess whether or not the benefits you're gaining outweigh sufficiently the harms or the risk of harm that you are likely to encounter, uh, you need to go through something like this exercise. Figure out what the value of a desired outcome is to you. What's the probability that you're actually going to achieve that outcome by engaging in this activity, in the cases I'm talking about today, by using a a agricultural technology? The probability of a harm that you're going to have in securing that outcome, the severity of the harm if it were to occur, and are there any alternate methods of achieving the same end that, have, that give you the benefits with either a lower probability of harm or a lower severity of harm, or both. So I'm now going to walk through what, what I take to be the benefits of genetically modified agriculture. And uh, for probably the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about what I perceive to be the benefits. I'm then going to take a look at a tabulation of some of the harms that people have articulated uh, over the last 20 years with respect to genetic modification in agriculture. So I'm going to start with environmental benefits, and I'm going to look at uh, health benefits and then potential uh, yield benefits. So environmental benefits, so far the only things that we have genetically modified on a large scale have been crops that deal with weeds, allow us to deal with weeds, or crops that allow us to deal with pests. So it's bugs and weeds that have become, were the first focus of genetic modification. There are some other crops, crops like tomatoes that have mold resistance, but these are very, very small relative to the mass production of soybeans, corn, canola in the uh, general agricultural marketplace. So it produces crops, first of all, that are resistant to a potent herbicide, glyphosate. It's potent because it's a broad spectrum herbicide. It will kill everything that it lands on. That's not very helpful if you are a farmer because it will kill your crops if you spray a field with those crops. If you genetically modify, as has been done since 1995 and grown quite widely in North America since 1995, so about 17 years, if you modify the plant so that it, becomes, it, it no longer is susceptible to glyphosate, or it takes huge doses for it to be susceptible, then you can grow your crop and deal with the weeds using Roundup. Uh, glyphosate is much more environmentally friendly, it's not to say it has zero impact, but it's much more environmentally friendly than organophosphates, which is the standard uh, base for um, herbicides. And the organophosphates tend to build up in the environment, get into, uh, in, into the aquifers, and run off into lakes and rivers, and create significant problems. Glyphosate breaks down very quickly in the environment. So it's better, uh, we don't really have a perfect herbicide, but it's better than organophosphates. It requires fewer applications. That typically means that a farmer spends less money on fossil fuels, but also is burning fewer fossil fuels. There's zero tillage. A farmer can go out, plant the field without tilling it and exposing it to erosion by wind and water. And then, after the crop comes up, along with the weeds, spray it with 
uh, glyphosate and kill all of the weeds and have the crop survive. You get increased weed yields uh, from this because you have uh, less encroachment of weeds and less nutrients taken out of the soil by the competing weeds. The products to date that this has been uh, put into in a large way are soybean, canola, what in North America they call corn, but in the rest of the world they call maize. Uh, corn being a, a <coughs> more like a kernel in the case of uh, outside of North America. Tobacco and cotton. And canola, just for a little Canadian uh, pitch here. A canola was developed in the prairies of Canada and it has reduced the uh, uric acid of rapeseed down to about 2% and 45%. Uh, this is a, a fairly toxic acid that makes rapeseed an undesirable crop if it uh, uh, is being used in the oil supply for the food uh, chain. So uh, canola is Canadian oil low acid is the way they name for example. So this is a glyphosate resistant tobacco. You can see that heavy spray on both plants, it dwarfs uh, this plant, which has got the gene inserted in it, and this one is completely withered away. Uh, a, a proper application, this is a healthy plant, and this one is pretty much killed down. And these are the control where nothing has been applied to uh, either the GM or to the, uh, sorry, to the, the GM here, or to the uh, non-GM crop. And so you can see how effective the, uh, the modification is with respect to glyphosate. Before I leave glyphosate, let me say, uh, let me look ahead a little bit to one of the things that I, I do find disturbing. And when we get to the list of potential harms, I will revisit this. For about 15 years, yeah, yeah, about 15 years. Monsanto had the patent on Roundup. It also had the patent on the technology for Roundup Ready crops. Uh, this is a problem of the concentration of power in a very small group of individuals in one industry in this particular case. And uh, I think that is a serious issue. I will come back to why I think those of us who think it's a serious issue need not to focus so much on Syngenta and Monsanto and other seed companies because the problem is much bigger than that. And I will allude to pharmaceutical industry, to Unilever and its control of the uh, food chain. Uh, this is a much wider problem than just genetic modification, but I will return to that. So the other product, I said it was pests and weeds. The other major uh, modification has been to insert a uh, segment of DNA from Bacillus thuringiensis into the plant so that it expresses an endotoxin, a delta endotoxin, which kills the larval stage of moths and butterflies. It also kills the larval stage of mosquitoes and a few other organisms as well. Um, but the target here is essentially the larval stage of moths and butterflies. Bacillus thuringiensis as a bacterium is in nature everywhere. Everywhere in the world you will find this bacterium in the soils uh, and some often in the uh, floating in the air if the soil has been disturbed. If you buy it as a spread, in most jurisdictions it is legal as an organic spread. So you as an organic farmer can use it and you can still market your products as organic products because it's considered to be a natural uh, pesticide. These plants express it. The advantage of them expressing it is there's even distribution because the plant is putting the same amount out for each plant, whereas when you spray it, wind will concentrate it in some areas rather than others. Just your spraying practice is likely to have larger doses in some places than in others. The advantage here is there's no application of herbicides. So there's no use of fossil fuels to go out into the field and make the applications. And there's no chemicals going into the soil. Uh, the plant is expressing them. When the plant dies, the endotoxins break down very, very quickly. This is, in fact, a dream pesticide. Uh, that's why most uh, organic farmers don't have any difficulty with it if their jurisdiction permits it at about 80% of jurisdictions in North America. And I should look up the data on uh, 
the EU. But uh, about 80% in North America allow DT to be sprayed by organic farms. So here's, an, here's a delta endotoxin uh, expressing plant, a tomato plant, and one that isn't, it's been stripped by caterpillars, and this one has not. So you can again see the advantages of this, certainly to a farmer, no matter how you might feel about whether there are advantages to you. What's uh, soon to be relief that might be environmentally uh, advantageous? <coughs> Drought-resistant crops which require dramatically less water, so by inserting a gene into the plant, you make the plant able to survive drought, and you make it need less water in non-drought times, so lower irrigation rates. It's quite a lot less water that you need on these uh, crops, and the field trials are completed, and regulatory approval has, in fact, now been given by the, um, the um, Food, and Drug FDA, Food and Drug Administration of the United States. And the products are corn, cotton, uh, soybean, and canola that are the first target products that will go to market. They haven't yet been put onto the market, but the approval is there. So here's the difference in a drought circumstance with the gene inserted, and with the gene not inserted. So you can see, if nothing else, the yield advantages that you get by having a gene inserted. And here's just a chart indicating the advantages. So the, the product concept target range that you see here is what you want to achieve in order to claim that the product is doing what you want it to do, that it was worth the research and development investment, and it's worth marketing. And two new traits that are uh, close to market, nitrogen efficient crops, which dramatically reduce the nitrogen uh, requirements. The field trials are completed. It does not, as far as I know, have FDA approval yet. Uh, Canada, I hardly ever mention, because if the FDA approves it, it usually only takes a few months before Health Canada will also approve it in Canada. The situation in the EU is different, although the EU has now been approving at a rather a rapid uh, rate, a large number of plantings of uh, GM crops. One of the crops that's planted a lot now is soybean, and that part of that is the fallout from mad cow disease, where uh, there would need to be a replacement for um, high-protein, low-cost food to replace the use of uh, off of uh, leftover animal parts that were being fed before that may that likely are the reason for the cross-transmission of uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, uh, mad cow disease. So uh, less nitrogen is needed. The products are corn, uh, maize, cotton, soybean, and canola. And here is a chart about the performance level. So you get a 9% increase in yield with no added nitrogen uh, to the soil. And uh, there's, these give you the different events, and the yellow you can barely see is the control uh, in this particular case. So given population expansion and increasing uh, affluence, we're going to need all the help we can get in order to have a continuing safe, abundant, and reasonably affordable uh, food. So increasing yields is going to be, have to be part of this because we cannot, if you go back to the World Wildlife Fund uh, data, we cannot keep taking land and putting it into agriculture. We also can't keep taking land and paving it over, um, uh, which we seem to be doing at about the same pace as putting land into agriculture. We take out really good land and put marginal land into agriculture with the pattern in North America. So what yield benefits can uh, genetic science give to us? Well, the current traits already have increased yields, and here's a uh, diagram that comes from a crop science article by Troyer in 2006. Uh, this is U.S. data, and it starts in it starts in 1865 because that was the end of the Civil War. That was the point at which good data began to be obtainable, uh, and you can see that open pollination for maize right through till the almost the 1930s, it was just at the tail end of the 1920s, uh, when double crossing, hybridization, began to be uh, controllable and therefore much more 
uh, manageable in an agricultural uh, environment. So around 1930, we began to see a dramatic yield increase. Now, to be fair to, uh, perhaps Troyer uh, gives all the data on this too, to be fair, this is not just the science of hybridization. This was also the point in which we began to bring online artificial fertilizers and irrigation programs. It's also in uh, the United States when the government put a lot of money into universities to have extension programs where people would go out and work with farmers uh, to get the planting cycle uh, more effective, the timing of fertilization, or putting fertilizer on, uh, more effective. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the years 1930 to about 1960. And so it's not just the uh, use of genetics, in this case, population genetic techniques. Population genetics, surprising this came in the 30s, population genetics was developed by Fisher, Holdane, and Wright in the 1920s. It gave us a much better grasp of the genetic dynamics uh, that were going on in nature. And then we managed, after the biological revolution in the 1950s, in 1953, with the discovery of the double helical structure of DNA, we got to the point where we were able to understand at the population level how to make single crosses, and that increased the yield slope. And most of that is because of an increase in our genetic manipulative ability. Still, not molecular, this is still all population genetic, selective uh, breeding and hybridization up to this point. Then you can see, starting in 1997, 95, where the first plantings uh, agriculturally of molecularly altered crops started, the, the yield line goes up yet again. And here's what's important uh, from the Troyer article, in addition to these increasing yields from the use of genetic science. And that is, that it was an increase from 2 billion bushels in the early, that should be 1930s, not 1030, uh, 1046 was the Battle of Hastings, right? So this, this actually does come back after the Battle of Hastings. 1066, right? 1066, yeah. Um, so that's, that's uh, 1930s to 11.8 billion in 2006, and the amount of land planted in May in the United States went down by 22%. That's what you want to have happen for real environmental impact. Lower our footprint agriculturally, while at the same time increasing yields on the remaining footprint. So this ties back to um, environmental advantage. And it's not just big farmers that get advantages out of this. Uh, this is from uh, data, there's a wealth of data now available from agricultural research done in India by Indian research uh, organizations connected either to uh, economics departments or agricultural departments. And so the data here gives you what a small hold farmer with three um, acres is able to do in terms of increased yields. Cotton is the big crop in India. They still haven't adopted many food plants, but they are now beginning to be one of the major producers of cotton, and their use of GM cotton has increased their yields dramatically. Well, what health benefits? So that's the environmental and the yield benefits. What health benefits might you get from genetic science? There's really only one health benefit that most people have identified. It's a direct result of genetic intervention. And that is you get healthier crops. Less exposed to molds, less exposed, therefore, to potential toxins that are produced by those molds. And this is a, a list of uh, some of the uh, molds and fungi uh, that produce the toxins and some of the toxins that are there. The European corn borer compromises the cob of corn, and that's one of the major sources of toxins in the food chain in maize. And this is the what you get with a fusarium, an ear rot symptoms with insect damage. And you can see the beginning of the growth of a, a, a fungal growth on the top one there. Uh, you don't see the beginning here, but you see the damage, which is opening it up to aspergillus. And pretty soon, uh, you'll see uh, not just the minor symptoms that you have to look very closely for, but some fairly major symptoms of aspergillus uh, affecting the corn. So the health benefits are, it just makes the product healthier by keeping off the product 
the toxins that we don't want in our food chain. Um, another one, but this is more kind of general, uh, and I've said it a number of times already for the other slides, is that it gives us a continuing abundance of food that is reasonably affordable, certainly affordable for anyone in a rich country. New traits that are currently in trial that might uh, enhance, but aren't on, aren't there yet, are vitamin-rich oils, uh, vitamin A, B12, but the one that has been worked on the most vigorously is having oils that are higher than, currently higher, higher than, <coughs> no, it's not currently higher because it's not there at all, but it's putting into the oils the um, omega-3 fatty acids that you normally get from fish. So long chain omega-3 fa uh, fatty acids uh, are being put in. Whether there are health benefits from this, it depends on how much you, you trust certain randomized controlled trials in medicine is to the benefits of omega-3 fatty acids. And if you then put them into the food chain in this way, uh, everybody benefits uh, all the time that you have certain processed foods that have oils in them. Golden rice was an early example of an enhanced plant. Uh, unfortunately, it was riddled with problems uh, in its implementation. Uh, NGOs, I actually found myself uh, part of this uh, fight, squabbles among NGOs about who actually uh, was going to deliver it to which areas of the world and for what purposes and under what conditions. Uh, patent issues uh, that arose just made it much less effective and in some places an almost unmitigated disaster as a way of attempting to alleviate uh, certain health issues in, in some parts of the world, uh, Southeast Asia, China being a prime area. So a summary of the purported benefits of GM crops. So this is just tabulating what I've gone through. Uh, lower pesticide and herbicide applications, safer pesticides in the case of using uh, glyphosate, reduced fertilization in the nitrogen case, which is just coming on the screen, reduced water consumption, which is only a year or so away with the drought tolerance, less soil erosion from zero tillage, and land use conservation by cutting down on our footprint by increasing yields on a smaller footprint. Food security enhancements, increased yields, and then the health enhancements that I've just gone through. On the other side, oh, okay, this is just a you know, segue slide. So benefits are always, as I said, they're being accompanied by harms. And so one has to do the trade-off. One has to ask whether the benefits are worth running risks or whether the benefits sufficiently outweigh the harms that you already know are there, whether you can mitigate those harms, knowing that they're there. Risks usually means you don't know the harms, and you've got to be vigilant for when they arise. Um, so what are the purported harms of GM? Now, if you remember for point number two here, I said at the beginning that on a Feinberg scheme, you should always look to see if there's alternatives, because there's an alternative that will get you to where you want to be without the same level of harm or the same probability of harm, then you should take the alternative path. So the second question is, wouldn't organic agriculture be a better con uh, alternative to conventional agriculture instead of GM? And remember I said I'm a pluralist, so I've argued for GM, I'm now looking at some of the potential, well, believe me, the potential downsides of GM. Um, I'm a pluralist, so I'm not ruling out by anything I say organic agriculture. But I will now try to tame that side of the enthusiasm curve, just as I tried to boost the rather, I, I suspect, suppressed enthusiasm for GM. So here's a list of reported harms that I run into frequently. And I've added to this list, as I've given this lecture, I've uh, had some really strange harms mentioned to me. Uh, and I really have not been able to decipher well enough to put here. Maybe somebody will have one I should add to the list. Before I start this, let me emphasize it's been 17 years in North America <coughs> since we started growing on a large scale uh, crops like soybean. Soybean was one of the early ones. And uh, mm -hmm. maize. Uh, canola came a little bit later. But we've got 17 years of experience. If a pharmaceutical has been out on the market for 17 years, 
and we haven't seen much in the way of downsides. Most people consider it to be reasonably clean. Now, again, to go back to something I said earlier, the price of technology is vigilance. The minute you think to yourself, oh, 17 years, well, I guess it's safe, we will find in the 18th year something that we weren't expecting. So 17 years gives a pretty good buffer of confidence, but it isn't 100%. And anybody who lets their guard down doesn't understand the potential downsides of any technology. Uh, even um, fuel uh, injection systems in cars. Uh, it was about five years. The sixth year was when we began to see some uh, particular downsides that then got remediated. Uh, from uh, fuel injection systems as opposed to the old style carburetor uh, systems for engines. So technology always needs our attention. So let's go through the purported uh, harms. The environmental ones and the agribusiness ones I've separated out. So loss of heritage stock. This is serious. Fortunately, it is as serious for the companies who are engaged in agriculture and, and genetic modification uh, as well in that part of agriculture as it is for everybody else who doesn't want to see the narrowing of the gene pool uh, with respect to agricultural plants. Because Monsanto, 50% of its business is still conventionally hybridized seeds. Uh, Syngenta, it's slightly higher than 50%. For Pioneer Hybrid, it's nearly 60%. For them, it matters that they can go back to older stock to pull out characteristics and traits and try new hybridization. So long before genetic modification, this was an issue for companies and for society. And we've now managed to be able to get our minds around conserving in seed banks and planting those seeds so that you don't find a reduction in the uh, quality of the germplasm just because they're sitting around under even a, a rather ideal uh, circumstances for storage. So we are managing this one much better than we did 25, 30 years ago. And everybody's on board. Big companies, small companies, uh, governments, everybody is on board to deal with this. Could we do it better? We always do things better. But we're doing a pretty good job on this one, probably about as good as we currently can do given our knowledge. Adventitious presence, this is where something uh, takes over. Uh, I don't know, purple loose strife is the example always used in North America because it just ran rampant in North America once introduced and became a, a weed of proportions that, uh, while it looked beautiful at first, people now uh, desperately wish they could get rid of. So it's something that gets into the environment and effectively takes over. So it's, it, it handles adventitiously and it begins to dominate the landscape. Unlikely that we're going to see this after 17 years, <coughs> because we haven't seen it yet. And there is a reason why we have cautious optimism, but cautious, about the future. And that's because most agricultural plants that we are modifying could not survive without human tending. I live in a rural area in uh, just north of Toronto. I have uh, 10 acres, 2.5 hectares and I grow a substantial vegetable garden. I know that if I don't get out there and weed on a regular basis, the weeds will survive and my planted crop will disappear. And it's just, they're not competitive. So it's unlikely that any of these are gonna get out and take over. Not impossible. But if you want a much scarier situation, we have done medical work producing recombinant insulin factor eight for hemophiliacs and so on, much longer, uh, since about the middle 1970s actually, uh, we've been modifying bacteria, and mostly it's been E. coli. E. coli live in our gut. Uh, the ones that live in our gut are very useful to us. Uh, there are ones that are not so useful. If they got out, even though we've inserted genes in them that are designed to make them also, uh, non-viable outside of very specific laboratory conditions. If they got out and we were wrong about what we had tailored them to do, they would do far more damage than what we could anticipate here. And I, I, I will press, if uh, necessary, that we are incredibly tolerant of science and technology in medicine and very reluctant in food. 
And that seems to me to be an inconsistency in our thinking. And then the inconsistency is we all want medicine to continue to make us better, to give us better lives. And we think we've got enough food, and it's pretty good food, and it's pretty reliable as a source of food. And so we, can, we, have, the, we have the luxury of debating issues around food, whereas we don't feel we have the same luxury with regard to medicine and the curing of disease. But they are, we are doing it in both domains, and doing it quite, quite aggressively. This one gets all of the negative air quality. Development of uh, resistance. In the case of GM, uh, the companies, again, have a vested interest in not seeing resistance develop quickly. The story of DDT terrifies the industries as much as it terrifies the public and governments. Because Monsanto, for example, Syngenta pretty close, put a billion dollars into the research and development for their first genetic round of crops. If in three or four generations like DDT, it becomes ineffective or vastly reduced in effectiveness, that's a lot of money down the tubes. So they have a vested interest in not seeing resistance develop uh, along the way. One of the ways in which uh, farmers uh, have to sign the contract, uh, they have to plant what's called a refuge crop. In one of these kinds of patterns, and it's got to be 20% the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States demands 20%, uh, so do all other regulators now, uh, actually. And 10% uh, by population genetic modeling should stop resistance from developing for a very long time. And by a very long time, we mean 100 years into the future. 20% will almost guarantee it. And the idea is, if you had nothing but GM, and let's assume it was like the DDT story, then what you've got are a few groggy larvae that kind of make it around. They have some resistance. They will interbreed. And slowly you will breed up a population of organisms that have uh, either that level of resistance or even higher level of resistance to the pesticide. If, on the other hand, you have 20% regular crop, the very small number that will survive in the GM plant will outbreed with the 20% that have uh, have no uh, exposure to genetically modified crops. And so you will continually swamp the resistant ones, the ones that have any genetic propensity for resistance with those that don't. Um, as I say, 10% on population genetic modeling seems enough, but 20% is the margin of error that uh, currently is considered to be reasonable. The other thing to uh, remember is that Basilus thuringiensis has been sprayed on crops since the 1950s. And in a spray form, it's the same, the same process, bacterium produces an endotoxin, the endotoxin in the stomach of the, uh, of the larvae uh, causes a little apicles to develop, and so you, the cell is actually ruptured because of uh, water crossing into, the, crossing into the cells. And it's been used since the 1950s, and we have not, even without any of these measures, seen the development of resistance to it. So it does appear that this is already a, a particular toxin to which uh, the development of resistance is going to be very slow. This will slow it down even more. So effects on species, the monarch butterfly was uh, a big uh, cause in uh, Canada. Oh, I think it was about three years ago, four years ago. And uh, uh, several teams, two from the United States, uh, three from Canada, Mark uh, Sears from the University of Guelph in Ontario, heading up one of the teams, uh, did a study <coughs> to find out whether it was GM, because it was being blamed, for the decrease in the monarch uh, butterfly population. It was there was clearly a decrease. The conclusion of all the research was it wasn't GM. There was a cyclical issue uh, with respect to monarch butterflies, and that they expected the populations to return uh, in subsequent years to have to do with weather patterns and a, a bunch of other issues that were fairly complicated. And the monarch butterfly population has come back in the uh, prairie areas of uh, Canada and in the United States. Uh, this is a kind of quickie throwaway comment from Mark Sears. In National Geographic News in 2010, 
Uh, Sears pointed out that he has witnessed more damage to the butterfly population through roadkill while driving along country roads than he did in his experiments. Uh, I mean, it's a bit flippant, but he, he was trying to get the idea across that there does not seem to be an agricultural basis for worrying about impacts on modern butterflies. There are lots of other impacts that are as great. Then we come to the agribusiness ones, which I've already signaled. I, you know, I, I, I do worry about this. Uh, large concentration of control in a small number of companies of something that's relatively vital to human existence is always problematic. But I don't think that we do ourselves any service by picking little favorite targets that get a lot of sympathy or a lot of traction in the public press in trying to deal with these things. It's the old story of hard cases make bad law. So focusing on very narrow uh, issues that mask a whole lot of other uh, factors do not get you to a good decision. Unilever is a large multinational food company. Go to Unilever's site and see how large they are. The boasts about the number of employees they have, the number of countries in which they operate, the number of product lines that they produce. So when you go on a grocery store shelf for products that are uh, processed products, not tomatoes and, and lettuce, um, many, many of those products are Unilever products, even though they have different brand names on them. So Brook Bonds, well, it used to be Unilever, maybe it was a I should be careful. But uh, Brook Bonds, two years ago, was a Unilever uh, brand. If you go on their website, they'll give you the, the thousands of brands that they have. And the interesting thing is that Monsanto, the gross revenue of $8.6 billion, compared to what Unilever spent on research and development, just research, and, oh, sorry, advertising and promotion, at least on research and development. Advertising and promotion, 6.8 billion Unilever spent just on advertising and promotion of their products compared to what Monsanto gets every year from everything they do. So the concentration is a problem, a serious problem. I, I, pharmaceutical companies, as I've signaled, is another one that really worries me. But what we need to do is take a larger canvas and think about how to deal with large multinational corporations that control all the vital resources, and not get stuck on some little portion of it, and then ignore the huge domain in which we have multinational operations having effective monopolies over uh, domains of, in this case, food, but in the other case I've mentioned, pharmaceuticals. The impact on small hold, small scale farmers, uh, a lot has been made of this. I consider myself to be a minor small scale farmer since I, I have about a half a hectare uh, of garden that I grow every year, vegetable garden that I grow every year. Um, and I would never think of keeping my seeds from year to year, which is the big concern here that you have to keep going back to the seed company if you're a small old farmer. And I don't do it for two reasons. One, I bought the seeds in the first place because they were hybrids and they had traits that came from the hybridization. If you keep hybrid seeds and you plant them, you will get, on average, 50% hybrids, 25% heterozygotes for one of the parents, and 25% heterozygotes for the other. So 50% won't have the trait that you want. Uh, I don't want to plant a, a row of something and discover that half of it is, does not, in fact, have the trait that I want. <laughs> so most farmers will buy their seed every year if you can do so. Now, I know in East Africa, this is a big problem because it's not that they don't want to, they just can't. Uh, also, I buy it because uh, I've kept seeds that are open pollinated seeds, not hybrids. And after about the third or fourth planting, you do begin to lose vitality in the quality of the seed. I buy seed potatoes every year for somewhat the same reason. I also buy them because I know that they have been controlled for various kinds of uh, infections. And I really don't want any contamination in my field by uh, growing potatoes year after year. The potato fat in Ireland was too much of a lesson for me. So um, small hold farmers, if you go into places like Eastern Africa, you might begin to see that there's an issue here. But I'd say anywhere in the rich world, farmers of any, any size at all, even vegetable gardeners, 
will usually get their seeds from a seedsman. Organic farmers will buy seeds from a seedsman because they want the hybridized trait. They will buy them from a particular seedsman that will guarantee they haven't done anything with the seeds other than hybridize them, but they will buy them because they want those traits in those seeds. The purported health harms, allergies, uh, in 17 years, there's only been three cases that seem at all connected. Uh, now I compare this to every new medication that comes onto the market. Uh, the allergic reactions to vaccinations uh, are much, much higher than anything we've seen uh, connected to uh, food that's genetically modified. So even if those three cases were able to be documented, it's been pretty hard to actually trace them definitively to GM, but even if they were, this is a really low rate of uh, allergic reaction from introducing something into the uh, marketplace. Harmful pheno uh, secondary phenotypic uh, traits, so something about the plant that becomes harmful as a result of the genetic modification. This seems unlikely given what we know about the science and we haven't seen it yet. I, I, I will keep saying 17 years is 17 years, it's not a thousand. And every year, with one more chance that something could show up. At this point, nothing that uh, has rung any alarm bell. Unlike about 20% of pharmaceuticals that are put on the market, many of which are withdrawn, and many of which have to be uh, re-stabilized because of various kinds of reactions that people are having. Once it's out, it never showed up in the randomized controlled trials. Uh, creating reservoirs for pathogen development, we, that's where uh, we modify something and it now allows a pathogen to develop because of the changed environment. Uh, that may be more true of animals than plants, and so far we've only been successful with agricultural products in uh, modifying plants. Animals are really hard because most of the traits are quantitative traits, which means there's more than one uh, segment of DNAs involved, more than one gene, and they're highly plastic. Uh, they have high plasticity uh, to environmental issues, and there's a lot of developmental pathway issues that make animals really hard to genetically engineer, multicellular animals. So plants are much simpler, and that's why you have more success there. Uh, so we're, we have not seen any of this uh, in any of the 17 years. So let me now go to the organic movement uh, to pull on the other side. So why wouldn't we just say, well, Organic, surely better than GM, given, yes, 17 years is 17 years, but hey, you know, this is, this is a technology that's really new. It's, and so the claims that are made is it's more environmentally friendly, it's healthier, and it's more natural. I will end with looking at a problem with you. But first of all, more environmentally friendly. Uh, this, I think, ends up as a bit of a stalemate, uh, and here's why. Organic agriculture really can't do anything about the impact that animals have on the environment. The methane produced by, by cows on an organic farm is the same as the methane produced by cows on a conventional uh, farming operation. The fecal material, the manure, has the same nitrogen structure whether it comes from an organically raised cow or whether it comes from a conventionally raised cow. The urine contains the same levels of urea uh, for the same cow, regardless of which farming technique you use. And most of the environmental impact from farming, if the World Wildlife Federation broke it down, comes from animal agriculture. I am what I now term a piscatarian. Uh, I'm a vegetarian that eats fish. Uh, part of the reason that I don't eat meat, uh, land animals, let me put it out. Part of the reason I don't eat land animals is because I don't like the way in which they're raised and the way in which they're slaughtered. Organic maybe to do something about that, by the way, but it then has still has the downside of the demand <coughs> for beef. Another reason is I think we have to get off our propensity for wanting to get our protein, our caloric intake through meat. Uh, it has got all kinds of agricultural problems. If people got more from uh, vegetable non-meat sources, uh, I probably shouldn't eat fish out because the fisheries are pretty much in trouble, but uh, that's a compromise, uh, uh, which I admit to. Probably an inconsistency, which I admit to. Um, but 
uh, we've got to get off our passion. I, the EU isn't that much different than North America. But the North America, the United States, is vastly ahead in the consumption of beef of any other part of the world. And that just has to, get, has to be scaled back if we're going to mitigate environmental damage. And then I've given some of the aspects of animal manure that make it an equal environmental calamity, whether you're an organic farmer or not. Where you may make gains in organic farming, oh, uh, this is more stuff on the nitrogen content, so uh, most of it's rapid release, but some of it's slow. The uh, end point is it gets into the groundwater, gets into the rivers and lakes, and then an ammonia volatilization occurs, and it goes as nitrogen gas up into the atmosphere. So there are, there are serious downsides. Um, okay, more stuff that I've already said. So it's, uh, the animal, the water requirements, however, uh, I haven't mentioned before, they're very high for animals. And the amount of plant material that an animal has to consume in order to concentrate the protein that we eat is vastly more than uh, what we would get if we ate, uh, vastly, requires vastly more than if we ate plants directly. Now I think we're going to slide. Yeah, organic can do very little about this, but it might reduce or eliminate the use of antibiotics and organisms. And that surely would be a plus on a whole range of dimensions. Uh, if nothing else, it will so somewhat mitigate the resistance that we're seeing developing to the use of antibiotics, because some of those resistances are from agricultural use. The vast majority are actually from physician use in medicine. Uh, and uh, poor prescription and patient non compliance in completing courses of antibiotics. But this is a contributing factor in agriculture as well. So there are obviously, I think, some gains to be made by moving in that direction. Um, it might feed them organically produced plant material. Not entirely clear that that's going to make a whole lot of difference. The evidence suggests that it's pretty much neutral, and it certainly has negative land uh, use implications. Um, it might allow them to graze in pastures, but as with them, all of these things, scale is what's due to this. The image uh, of the organic farmer who has you know, half a dozen cows, and a few sheep, and a few pigs wandering around, that image is very kind of a throwback to a simpler life. That's not what organic farming is like in North America. It's not what organic farming is like uh, on the mainland uh, Europe. Well, I guess that is Europe. The UK is part of Europe in a sense, but maybe not after the continent. Um, so in Europe, uh, ag organic agriculture has become big business. In California, there are organic agricultural farms that are bigger than conventional agricultural farms. Huge business. So once you get to, to that level, um, the idea of grazing in pastures becomes problematic because let's just eat all the grass here. You've got a massive amounts of land in order to raise that volume of livestock for organic production. Um, getting rid of uh, synthetic herbicides and pesticides, this is probably a stalemate with GM because they also are reducing the foot, the GM is reducing the use of these. And so uh, one's doing it one way, getting off synthetic uh, pesticides and herbicides, at least the really dangerous ones and environmentally damaging ones. And uh, another one's doing it another way. But rodenone, for example, which is used widely in organic farming as a pesticide, is not environmentally neutral. Uh, it's not synthetic, but it's not environmentally neutral. So uh, it, this is just different techniques. And the evidence suggests that you know, they all are contributing to a mitigation of environmental damage in a, in a different sort of way. It's healthy. This is the one that I hear almost all the time. And the simple fact is there's no evidence. Now, I'll come to the fact that no evidence doesn't mean that it isn't true that it's healthy. Just there's no evidence at this, at this point. Here's the House of Commons Agricultural Committee uh, reporting in 2001. Starts off with this uh, wonderfully ironic kind of phrase. This is not to accuse the organic movement of misleading the public. But when you start out with a sentence like that, what else are you supposed to assume other than, well, I guess they are. 
But it is perhaps true that the public has a perception of organic farming that is at least partly mythical. We believe it important that the claims can be tested and verified before the consumers know what they're really buying. And that goes on uh, the, the rest of the quotation. Similarly, in Canada, the uh, Parliamentary Information and Research Service, after having done a retrospective analysis of global research, says, although beneficial to the environment, maybe, organic farming methods are not guaranteed to produce healthier foods than those produced by conventional farming methods. The label organic does not provide any guarantee of a product's quality or nutritional value. And then uh, from the Journal of Food Science and Nutrition, the highlighted areas, evident from this assessment that there are a few well-controlled studies that are capable of making a valid comparison. With the possible exception of nitrate con uh, content, there is no strong evidence that organic conventional foods differ in concentrations of various nutrients. While it is likely that the organically grown foods are lower in pesticide res residues, there has been little, very little documentation of residue levels. So, as I signaled, the absence of evidence doesn't mean that there's a difference and that if we really looked hard, we would find the difference. It's just so far, we haven't found any difference with what work we've done. But there are reasons to believe that we're not going to find stark health differences. And let me just pick on one that worries people a lot, and that is the chemicals that are used in agriculture. Some of them are going to be carcinogens, and therefore we are better with organic food because it will reduce those carcinogens in our food supply. So this is um, uh, an article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in the United States. Uh, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration assayed food for 200 chemicals, including the synthetic pesticide residues thought to be of greatest importance. The residues of some industrial chemicals, such as polychlorinated biphenyls, the FD found, FDA found residues for 105 of these chemicals. The U.S. intake of the sum of these 105 chemicals averages about 0.09 milligrams per person per day, which we compare to 1.5 grams of natural pesticides. That is, plants protect themselves. Uh, nobody in the right mind would eat uh, uh, leaves with a on alkaloid plant because uh, it produces, um, among other compounds, atropine and other quite deadly toxins. Plants protect themselves against being eaten, they protect themselves against uh, wind damage by a whole host of beings, and many of those are toxic to human beings. And we eat them. Uh, nonetheless, and we pretty much have to eat them, and we've managed to figure out how to do them in quantities that aren't going to be uh, incredibly damaging. But this 99.9% .9 natural is that if you do an assay of the various chemicals that are in food, and then you take how many have been added by agricultural chemical use and some industrial blown-in chemical use, you've got about 0.01 uh, well, I guess 0 0.09 here, of the uh, uh, stuff being put on as opposed to background words. That suggests you're not going to find a lot of difference between organic and uh, conventional farming in that respect. In addition, the cooking of food, and we cook lots of our food, the cooking of food is also a major dietary source of potential rodent carcinogens, that is carcinogens that we found out by rodent studies they give cancer to, uh, to rats. Chemicals and, and mice. Chemicals that at exceptionally elevated levels have been found to be carcinogenic in rodents are those kinds of carcinogens. Cooking produces about two grams per person per day of mostly untested burnt material that contains uh, many rodent carc known rodent carcinogens. Uh, polycyclic hydrocarbons, heterocyclic amines, and the list goes on. Thus, Thus, the number and amounts of carcinogenic or total synthetic pesticide residue appear to be minimal compared to the background of naturally occurring chemicals in the diet. This is again from the Ames paper and the proceedings of the Academy of Sciences. Um, let me finish uh, the organic thing with, so organic is more natural. I've never quite understood the word natural. I've written a number of articles on you know, it's, it, it's unnatural to behave in this kind of way or that kind of way. Uh, abortion is unnatural. Uh, going old is probably unnatural, actually, uh, the way we grow old. 
but uh, again, these senses of it. I've never been able to really figure it out. But if it means something like without human intervention, it's vacuums. Potatoes originated high in the Andes of Bolivia and Peru, and humans have selected and hybridized the potato for uh, well over uh, 2,000 years, yielding characteristics that were advantageous in agriculture and made the potato something that people wanted to eat. If natural processes were doing this selection, natural processes <coughs> on a natural potato from its, uh, its origin, the probability of today's potatoes be existing is vanishingly small. It's only because humans have gotten in there and messed around that we have the kind of potatoes we do today. Tomatoes that we have today bear almost no resemblance. The tomato variety of 2,000 years ago, or even those found by Cortez in 1519, uh, when he arrived <coughs> in the Americas. The Aztecs had already significantly changed the tomato, which initially was a very small fruit like this, somewhat bitter and somewhat toxic, because the tomato is a belladonna alkaloid plant, and it's of that family. And uh, it does have a level of toxicity. It's been bred out of it in tomatoes that ripen, but tomatoes that are green still have a high level of toxicity, which is why we've probably all been taught not to eat green tomatoes unless you cook them first to uh, transform the, the toxins. Um, so the Aztecs had already, uh, after about a thousand years or more, uh, modified them significantly, and we've been doing it ever since. And the same is true of the last 10,000 years of animal husbandry with cattle, goats, and other agricultural animals. So if an organic farmer wanted to be natural, an organic farmer would have to start with those original stock, and that would be what they would grow. Because everything else has been modified by humans into an unrecognizable <coughs> stock from its origin, and wouldn't be here if we hadn't done it. It's not as though we sped up the process. It just wouldn't be here if we hadn't done the selective breeding that we did, and later the hybridization that we did. The problem for organic is yield. These are, these are numbers for uh, EU countries and then uh, it should be Canada in there somewhere. Yeah, there is Canada and the United States. So the United States is the lowest in, um, uh, in uh, uh, the uh, organic agriculture at 0.4%. And then you can see the numbers going up uh, there. So uh, it's still a boutique industry. And in a pluralistic and open society, there's clearly a place for organic. And I'm a pluralist, remember? Uh, the place for organic. Uh, I think there's a place for shopping locally, but I wouldn't want to depend on local agriculture. That's what I see in Kenya. And when there's a drought, there's nowhere to turn if you're just local. Uh, international markets have given us abundant food in times of local difficulty. I claim it's got to be complemented uh, by GM agriculture, and we're still going to have some conventional agriculture. Hopefully, we can mitigate the damage as much as possible. Thank you.